we saw the IPv6 address. So we did a little further big exercise. So 28 bits for your prefix, 16 bits for your subnet inside your company, and then 64 bits for your interface ID. So the question is how we can build this interface ID. So we already saw that if we have a, a server, it's good to, to create here something that is easy to, to remember. So for example, column column one. So this, and if you have a, your laptop here, you don't need a special address, but in, instead you can use something based on your Mac address. So there is different way to play with the interface ID. So one way is, as I say, is to derive it from your Mac address. So for example, for those who have some Mac, here I think I have a population, but can you look at your interface, your EN1? Interface. If I type if config here for EN1, I have my MAC address here. So 00236C, you should have the same value on your interface, and then something different. Okay, because this say that it's a Mac computer, an Apple computer, and here is a serial number which is different for every equipment. And here, since ETAM doesn't give me, I don't mean, uh, send me a maybe six prefix, I just have my link local address. And my link local address is FEAT, column, column. And then I have something that looks a little bit like my MAC address. We will see in more detail after how we compute that. But you see we have 236C, here we have 2663C, then FFFE, and then 9767C. Uh, so here is a MAC address. So the MAC address is unique, so this address is unique. If you have a Windows, who is in Windows 7? Okay, so if you type IP config on your uh, shell, on your command, sorry. you may have also something that starts with FPA. But the rest is not your MAC address. Microsoft used a random number instead. But we will see that in some example in, in the future. So this is one possibility. The other possibility we have seen is to use for a server, for example, something with one, two, three, four. There is two reasons to use that. The first one is that it's easier to remember a small number than a mechanics. And the second reason is when you have a server. Maybe you want to upgrade your server. And you want to, for the purpose of the upgrade, you have one uh, card, infinite card, but one at 100 megabit per second, and it's not enough, so you want to change your infinite card to a card that goes to one gigabit per second. If you do that, you change your MAC address. And if you change your MAC address, you change your IPv6 address. So you are to reconfigure all your equipment, to be able to know, new, to know the new address. If you force your address to be the same, and independent of the internet card, so if you change your host, your computer, if you change the internet card, so there is no problem, the address will always be the same. So one possibility is, for example, to put one, two, three. Another possibility is, for example, you have a web server that runs on an IPv6 address, for example, 148.205.1.55. So you select column column 55, 
because it remains the value the end of the administrative service, and before it. Or another possibility that is very popular is, for example, the web server will be current current 80. Since 80 is the port number for HTTP, it's a way to remember that it's a uh, is this. You can do the same thing for the DNS or for uh, so use the port number of the server of the service to put it as service address. Several others. So this is one possibility. So these are two ways to number, and there is another way, the one used by Microsoft, is to use a random value. There is a problem with address derived from the MAC address. I was in France one week ago, and I was connected to IPv6 network in France, and I go to some server. So my IPv6 address was the prefix of Telecom Bretagne and an interface ID based on my MAC address. And then I move to Mexico. I go to the ETAM network and in a small and short future I will receive also an IPv6 prefix from ETAM. So my the IPv6 prefix here will be different from the one I will have in France. But the interface ID will be the same because it is based on the Ethernet address the, of my car. So it means that some site may track me and know that I was in France and now I am in Mexico. So I can receive commercial to learn Spanish or, or things like this. Because they know that I have moved from one country to another. So to avoid this, Microsoft says that here I will put a random number. And this random number is not exactly a random number, it's a hash of your MAC address on your global address. So this is right with this table. And you will add we have this for lifetime. So your PC will not change this address uh, all the time. And if you look at Microsoft, so I have here an example, but you can look on your laptop. So here you have F uh, FEAT and then you have this uh, random number here in the middle. If you look at global addresses, you see that here I have two global addresses. One is 280, uh, 201, 666, 73, 07, 62, 10. And then I have an interface ID. And here you see I have exactly the same 64 prefix. But here I have another value. So why? Because this one, the first one is permanent and will never change on your computer. And if you see the interface ID, it's the same as your micro your microcorrelus, the one used in your microcorrelus. And the other one is changed every day. So what is the advantage of this? If, if I'm running a server on my Windows 7, I will use this permanent address. And this permanent address can be registered in the DNS. And this one is not registered on the DNS and is used by client. So when I'm surfing the web, I am using this address. Tomorrow I will go to the same site, but my interface ID will be different. Okay? So this way, it's guaranteed you to be anonymous on the network. Or at least to be anonymous at your speed. Because at layer 7 you have cookies. And cookies will be able to track you. But it's not a problem for IP. It's a problem because Internet Explorer, Chrome, or other browser are maintaining cookies. But it's not a problem for IPv6. So you, you have this kind of thing, but some people do not like that. For example, you are a network manager, 
and you detect on your company network, a very good company network, that some, a user has a virus on its computer. So now, how you can locate this user? If you see different addresses, is it the same user? And maybe it has changed its address, or is it different user? So here you have a problem because you guarantee uh, to be anonymous outside of your company network, so that's good. But you are also anonymous inside your company network. So some network manager doesn't like this kind of thing. So you have also a possibility to disable this feature and use only the permanent app. So what, what is different between Microsoft and what you have in macOS, for example, is that in macOS, permanent address contains your MAC address. And your MAC address here, at the beginning, you have your vendor ID. So when I'm going to a site, you can know if I am using uh, HP, a Mac, a Dell computer. Because in the IP address, you have the brand of your computer. So, normally it's not a problem, but some companies are very paranoid and doesn't want to send this kind of information outside. So that's why Microsoft hides this by generating a random value. So you can have, we can have also a look on a more, because here I don't have any prefix, so I cannot show it to you. But if I go to a site in REN, so here I am obliged to use an IPv4 address, because I don't have any IPv6 connectivity. And if it works, so I am connected to a computer in REN. Now if I do if config, it's a Linux computer. So here I have name of my interface, Ethernet 0. I have, here you see my MAC address. Here is my IPv4 address, and here is a three IPv6 address I allocate to that interface. So here I have the link local address, and here I have two global addresses, and the same thing as what we have seen with Windows 7. They share the same 64, first 64 bits, so it means that they are in the same link. But here I have a very easy to remember address, is column column 1, and here I have the address derived from my MAC address. So this one is done automatically, and this one has been manually assigned. So here is the, name, the address of this computer is our name server. So this is very easy to, to remember the address, because I read it, uh, as I told you, 2001-660-73.01 is Telecom Britain. So, I will see this prefix everywhere at Telecom Time. When you will do practicals at Telecom Time, you will use this prefix. So, at the end of the, this week, you will know it by earth, and you will remember it when you will go to, to REN. And then the rest, I am on subnet 1, and it's computer 1. So, there is no big difficulties for, to remember the, this kind of address. Of course, the other one, you will never remember the interface ID based on the MAC address. If we come back to what we have said, so we, this is, when you will use a random value, it's a way to hide you for a little bit from the network. But sometimes you want to be authentified in the network. So there is another way to, to create addresses, it's something that is experimental, so you don't see it really in production networks, but there is a lot of interest from the scientific community 
to use this kind of things. So the idea is the following. Do you know what is a certificate? Yes? Because I don't know. Difficult to explain. More seriously, a certificate is something that contains a key that allows you to sign or unsign the network. So here you have, some, for example, a public key. And what you do is to sign your certificate using your private key. So this way, you sign it and you put the result here. You distribute this certificate and other people are able to do, to decipher the information and see that you have the good information. Okay? So, this is something that is used to authenticate you on the internet. For example, when you are connecting to a web server, you may use a certificate to authenticate that you are really connected to eBay or PayPal. And what we will do in IPv6 is to take this value and make a hash of this value, and the hash will be on 64, or it will be less, bits. And this will give you your interface ID. When you will send information, you will send it using IPsec, and you will cipher the information using your private key. And your IP address will have an interface ID that is based on your certificate. When you receive things, of course, you have an interface ID, and you know the certificate which is publicly available. So you can do the hash key and get the interface ID and verify that it's the same interface ID. And then you use the public key to uncipher the information and get the result. So this way you are able to authenticate the sender because only the sender can use this interface ID. Because we make a link using CryptoVR. So that could be a good solution to uh, authenticate host in the network. So it is used experimentally by some protocol on the internet. So the question is now, if you remember when we look at some uh, interface ID based on MAC, we didn't find exactly the MAC address. For two reasons. First, the MAC address is generally on 48 bits, and the interface ID is on 20, uh, 64 bits. So what we do, and it's not something done by the ATF, but that has been made by IEEE, is that to go to, uh, from uh, 48 bits to 64 bits, then we have FFFE in the middle. So this way we have 15 bits, so now the size is 64 bits. But we have a problem with the second bit. If you look at IEEE, IEEE tells you that this bit tells you if it's a universal or local address. When it's equal to zero, in IEEE meaning, it's a universal address, or an address that is read from the Ethernet card. If you want to force manually an address, then you have to set this bit to one. The problem is that if I say that universal address has this bit equal to zero, when I manually number an interface ID, I have to put this bit equal to one. And of course, most of the people will forget to put this bit to one. So to avoid this, the IETF say, okay, we are going to inverse the meaning of this bit. And when it's equal to 1, it means that it comes from a MAC address. And 
it's your computer that will put this bit equal to 1. So your computer will never forget to do that. And this way, human, when they number an interface, can leave this bit equal to 0 and just number 1, 2, 3, 4 here. So this way you avoid ambiguity. So that's why, if we come back to what we, we have on, on my interface, so you see that my MAC address is 000C29. And if I look at my uh, interface ID here, I have 02. That means that I have changed the value of the second bit and it becomes 2. Or for 1, it means 2. 0C, so it's OK. 29, it's OK. Then FFFE in the middle. And then the rest of the MAC address. So, why I am boring you with this kind of thing? Because sometimes you, you may get a device and this device picks only IPv6. It could look like science fiction, but uh, many years ago we got sensors from Japan, a German company, and they send us a sensor, but we don't have any manuals, or we have a manual in Japanese, which is uh, almost the same. And we didn't have any information how to configure the equipment. But on the bottom of the sensor, you have the MAC address of the device. So this way you can create using the algorithm you know now its link local address with the interface ID using this algorithm, and then you are able to connect on it. So that's Quite useful to know this if you have to connect to an equipment, you just know the MAC address. So, now you know everything on addresses, or almost everything on addresses. So, we are going to, to look more deeply on the link local address. Because you manage a little bit differently link local address from global address. So, link local addresses. Start with FE80, and then you have here your interface ID. So I'm going to, to try to make a demo in REN. So just to tell you the demo, it's we have a link, and on that link we have two computers. One is Blue Monet, and the other one is 0.6. Okay, so currently I am connected on Brad. Uh, sorry, it's not Brad Monet, it's Radamant. It's the same. So I'm connected to Radamant. We like complex name. Uh, so we are connected to Radamant, and what we see is that we have an address, so I will write it here FE80, colon, colon. 0, 2, C, etc., etc. And I have another prefix, 1, 2001, 6, 16, 73, 01, 1, slash 64. Okay, that's this one. Now, I'm going to connect to the other computer. So the other computer is 0.6. So this is a BSD computer, the one that was Linux, and here I have the IPv6 configuration for this computer. So what do we see here? 2001, 660, 7301, 1. So the 64 first bits are the same as Predator. So it means that since we share the same slash 64, we are on the same link. So I can try to ping the other one. So here I type ping sys 
7301 1 column column 1 Ok, so I am pinging Radamont Will it work? Look And here my ping work So it means that here I have succeed in reaching this computer and this computer answer. Now we are going to use Radamant link local address and do the same experiment. So normally I have here Radamant link local address. So I try to, to copy it. Let's see. I copy all and I will ping this, this, and here I have copied the magazine, the IPv6 address. Here we are on the same link. So can I use link local address to join the other record? I try. And it doesn't work. Why? That's a tricky question and a tricky answer. It's because when I was using the global address, I have a routing table in IPv6 that tells me that 2001 XTRX Rat Column 1 was an internet interface, internet zero. So by looking at the prefix of the destination, I was able to find the exiting interface. Now, once I'm doing FE80, all the interfaces on my equipment will have a link local address starting with FE80. So when I do a ping to FE80, the computer doesn't know which interface it can use to send the information. So he sent a stupid message, UDP connect, it's stupid because ICMP, uh, ping is an ICMP, so it's not UDP, network is unreachable, it's not that in the meaning it's unreachable, but in fact it means that I don't know which one to use. So, it's not really an answer. So, how we can solve this? In BSD, is to tell the system on which interface we are going to do the PIN. So, if I look at the interface, here, my interface name is BGE0. So here what we I do is to add a percent and then I put the interface name. Interface name. And this way it works. Here I was able to ping the other one. Because here I force my ping to go there. If for example I put another interface, for example Look back, so LE0, it's another interface on my computer, I send a ping on that interface, and here I have no answer, because I have no host with that name on the other end. Okay? So that's very important to scope link local addresses. So to scope link local addresses means that you add a percent on the name of the interface on which you want to send a file. If you are on Linux, you cannot scope your address, but you can use the command 
dash big I BGE and the name of your interface. And here, so by putting big I in the name interface, it's the same problem. So that's the thing you have to do in this in Linux to do that. If you look at Microsoft or if I do again, so here I am on Win on Linux on BSD, sorry. If I look at if config, you see that my clean local here is uh, is cop. Here I have percent BG0. If I if you look at your Windows, your Windows 7 uh, configuration. So it's what we have we have before here. You see that the MAC address here, you have sorry, your ring local address, and at the end you have person 12. And 12 is the number interface number in your Windows system. Okay, so that's very important to, to scope when you are doing a ping. So when when will we use link local address? For example, to ping a computer because you are starting some uh, configuration of your link and you don't have access to all the equipment, so maybe you can just go to the next equipment by using the link local address. In that case, you have to stop it. The other case where you will use link local address is when you are using, you will play with routing protocols. So what is a routing protocol? Is two neighbors that exchange information. So if they are, as they are connected on the same link, they can use their link local interface to communicate. And then they create routing table. And in the routing table, you have a prefix. And then you have the next stop. And the next stop is the host you can reach directly. So here you can put also a link of address. So it's what we we have in this example. Here you see it's a routing table, and it says that the default route is reachable by this gateway. And the gateway, for, for example, for, uh, is always something I can reach directly. So when I have FE 80, I have its interface ID, and on which interface I can reach again. We can have a look on a Cisco router. So now I'm here, so I'm going to do a telnet. on the Cisco router, so I load myself on the Cisco router as I will load on the Linux uh, or Unix equipment and then I become super user by typing enable command and here I type a secret fast word for that route. So now I am connected as root and I can type for example show IPv6 root and this command will show me the routing table for IPv6 of my Cisco. So what do we see here? So it's something you will see also during your practical ingress. So it's uh, very useful to know the Cisco syntax. So if you look at the first column here, you have a letter. And this letter will tell you how the router has learned the information. So if you see a C, it means that it's directly connected. So it's a, an interface of the router. So you have the, here the name of the interface. And here you have the prefix that is used on this interface. If you see a S, an S here, it's a static route. It means that you are manually configured the equipment. 
So, for example, here, I say that the default root, so colon colon slash zero, I can send to that router. And here you see also that the router address is done with a very uh, static IPv6 address because the interface ID is colon colon one. So that's very interesting to use that when you are using static routes because suppose that you have a router here and you configure your default route to a next stop which is FE80 and here you do give and then statically an IP address based on the MAC address and you have this router here that has this address. And one day you change your router. You put another router instead. So the, IP, the MAC address change, the IPv6 address change, and this router will not send to you information. So when you are doing static routing, it's better to force an interface ID to be uh, something you can type easily, and that it will remain if you change from one router to another one. And here, if I put this value here, it's not, uh, it does, sorry, not FEAT, but here, the global address. So here, it will never change, even if I change the next. So that's the interest here to, to do that. Here I have another static address. So to reach this, it's on my local interface, so this is not the most important one. So here, I have over static rules. So here, it is on term manually. And if I continue, here, uh, here, you see, I have a static route, but here I have used the link local address, and I force, I have to tell after on which interface I have to send it. If I was using a global address, I don't have to tell where is this global address, because in my routing table, it's written somewhere, but where is this address? Okay, and if you look, I don't know if we have this, with an R here. I have, when I have an R here, it means that it's learned by a routing protocol for a bit. And here you see that the entry is a link of address. So I, automatically the system will use link of address and will not use the address. But statically, you can so, another kind of address we, we have talked a little bit before is what we call EULA address or universal uh, local, uh, unique, sorry, local addresses. And these addresses normally start with FD and then you have 40 bits for a random number. That means that here you have a slash 48 and then you can manage an addressing plan as, as you want. So you can use this, for example, if you are running a test network inside your company and you are not connected outside. So you, are, you cannot ask for official prefixes, so you can use this kind of prefix. So it's very easy to obtain, to have this kind of prefix, you go to a website, for example, you go to cxs.net and you have a database. So the database is a full list of prefixes. And for example, you can see here. Yeah. So this is my ULA prefix. It's not very useful, and they will use it, but you can have one if you want. How do you do that? 
you go on the pre uh, previous page, and here, for example, you put the MAC address of your computer. You put information concerning you, your email, your website, etc. And you do register, and the system will return you a unique value. And you know that this value is not used by anyone else, and you will use it in, you can use it after you find your address in time. So, what is the interest of this uh, kind of things? At the beginning, in IPv4, you have a big problem when you are a big company. And you buy another big company. Usually, these companies are using the SRAM addressing space, 10 slash 8, to run their equipment. So, when you want to merge these two networks together, it's very complex because you will have ambiguity. It means that you will have equipment that will, different equipment that will have the same IP address. So it's a real nightmare to do uh, this kind of thing. So in IPv6 at the beginning, they were using the same thing. And if you look at very old standard of IPv6, there was a kind of address called FEC, if my memory is, is good, slash uh, 12, but we are used for site local address. So you were able to define your site local address, FEC0, and then you get a slash 48, and you can number everything in your slash 48. Another company will be able to start the same addressing plan, and of course, if you want to merge these two network, company networks, you will have problem. Because normally you will have the same um, uh, subnet ID, 1, 2, 3, etc. So, so to avoid this, this kind of uh, site local prefix has been discarded, and instead you got the ULA prefix. The difference is that instead of having plenty of zeros between the slash 12 and the slash 48, then here you, you have 40 bytes of a random number. And this, of course, the risk of collision is very, very low. So if two companies select the same value, it will be unlocked. But if these two companies uh, are buying each other, it's almost impossible. So it means that if you buy these two, uh, these two companies are merging the network, then the random number will be different, and interconnection will be possible. So that's why it's better to use ULA prefix. And ULA prefix are sometimes popular, or at least on the paper, because you can, as in IPv4, use them. So you can number your company using ULA, and then you will put a NAT at the end, at the exit point, and this NAT will transform your ULA prefix into a global prefix. So this NAT is called NAT66, because you have IPv6 on one side and IPv6 on the other side. So the NAT we saw this morning is now called NAT44, because you have IPv4 on both sides. So I will not go into details now on IPv on NAT66, but we will see day after how it works. So the interest here is that if I'm changing my provider, I don't have to reconfigure all my URL network, I just have to reconfigure my NAT66 with a new prefix, and I will be connected to a new provider. So this is still experimental, but it's a way to make both addressing plan totally independent. So this is for ULA. And the last kind of address we are going to see is multicast address. So multicast addresses start with FF prefix, 
And then you have four bit for flags. I will not go into details about flags because we, we, are, we are not going to, to see how we manage large multicast group. But this is used for that. And then we have a spot. So here you have to make the difference between the scope we had before, when I told you about improper address, and we put a stop on the address, on this scope here, that is where you can send the information. For example, if you have a value 1 in the stop, it means that your multicast packet will never leave your computer. So it's used, for example, for two processes inside your computer to communicate. The one we will see a lot is value 2. When you have value 2, it means that you, can, you will send the thread on a link, on your link. So it will not be put outside of your link, but this way you can reach something, some equipment, on your link. And then you have some administrative division. And for example, if I was using 4, I can say that 4 is, when I'm sending a broadcast message here, 4 is for Santa Teresa. And if I'm using 5, is for Italy. So I will be able to send both in Santa Teresa and if I put 8, it will be, for example, all the university in Mexico. So I will have different scope. And if I want the worldwide, I will put value E. So normally you will not see these values. The only two you will have is two for things on the link, on the link, on site is on my company network. So if we look at addresses, so here I took start from uh, uh, the page, the page, that took the values. But of course we can use a column column notation, and I have an address, for example, FE. 0, 2, column, column, 1. That means all nodes on your link. So we can add an example. Here. So, I start, I, I have left my, uh, my router. So I am now again on my uh, BSD, so 0.6 network, the host, and I type ping sys f02 column column 1. So here I'm sending a multicast ping, and this multicast ping will be received by all the devices that are connected on my link. And all the devices will answer to me, and this way I will have the list of all the equipment that are connected on my link. So I do it and it doesn't work. Why? It's the same problem we, we had with link local addresses. It's that I don't say on which interface I will send the multicast. So I have to scope twice the address. I have one scope here, 0, 2, or 2 here that tells that it's on my link and it cannot be routed outside of my link, and another scope here that says that I will have to send it on BG0. And here I have the answer. So I will stop it. So if we study the listing here, what do we have? I have sent an ICMP message. And this message, as a sequence number. So I got the first example for sequence number 5. I've got one answer from one post. And so here I have the link report address of this post. But the other host answer also. So here it's called duplicate because the ICMP sequence is the same. But you see that the IP address, the IP is fixed address, the link local address here, is different. So here I have an answer from all the hosts on my link. You see that here in, a, in this network, 
we have a lot of IPv6 uh, equipment. Is it just dangerous to do that? In IPv4, it is not recommended to do this kind of thing. For example, in IPv4, oh, we can look, see on, on the example. If I do, I can't do, if config, I have, if config, I have here my broadcast, IPv4 broadcast address. So I can do the same, ping, 192.108. 119 and 255. So this way I will send a ping packet using a broadcast message and all the router will receive information. All the equipment, sorry, will receive the information. Here I just add one duplicate and it's come from our router. But the other equipment doesn't understand. In IPv4, the broadcast address is very dangerous because I am at ETAM and I don't like people from another university. Let's say I don't like people from IPN. Okay? So what do I do? I want to block IPN website. So I will send, for example, to France to a broadcast address, a ping, and I forge my source address. I put IPN web server instead. So what will happen? I'm sending one packet on the internet, and I may receive, I may generate dozens of packets that will go to IPN website. So this way I can have a very small link and I multiply by the 12 factor, for example, the number of packets I have received. So this is very dangerous. So when you design a protocol on the internet, you have to avoid this kind of packet multiplication because it can create the dynamo of service because you can saturate some people. So, here it's IPv4. In IPv6, I cannot do that. In IPv6, when I do my ping 6, ping 6 here, I have done it locally. You remember, I have to tell on which interface I send the packet. So it means that I have to be on Telecom Broadline's network to do that. I cannot do it from outside of this network. So I cannot attack another equipment. And if you look at the answer, the answer is with link local address. So it means that here, the answer cannot leave my link local network. So if my link network so it's, it, it's here, impossible to flood something outside. What I can do is to break this network, because if I do a pink flooding on this thing, I may saturate my local area network with a lot, lot of traffic. But it means that the person that attacks the network is inside. So if you, if you are protected on if I am inside the network, I can do a lot of things to break the network. I can run a DHCP server, a wrong DHCP server, and give wrong IP address. It's another solution. So if you, are, you have a, a foot in the site, then you can do bad things. But in IPv6, you cannot do bad things from outside. So that's one interest of this address. FE FF02 column column 1 
because it allows you to discover all the equipment on your link with good form management, but you cannot do it for us. It cannot be used as an address. You have another address, which is FF02, column, column 2. And this address is used to discover routers on your link. So here, if I type ping 6 FF02 column column 2 and here I scope me and my address by BG0 then here you see I will have less answers in fact in that network I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 answers so I have 5 equipment that can be used as routers and this is very important during the bootstrap, bootstrap phase on my network. Because using this, I can talk with routers. I have created my link local address, and then I will use the router group. And I will tell them to the router, give me the network configuration. And the router will be able to answer with my link local address. And this way I will get the network configuration from the loop. So that's the interest of the link of routers. Oh, the, sorry, the multicast address. So, just before leaving, we have some complex address here that you will see a lot when you will do practicals in REN is what we call solicited address. So if you look at the address, you have FF02, column column 1, column FF, and then 3 bytes. So, this is used to suppress something that is not very efficient in IPv4 using IRP protocol. When you are doing IRP in IPv4, what do you do? You, you send a broadcast request on your link. So at the MAC layer, it's toward FF, FF external. So it means that every equipment that is connected on the network we receive the query and we have to process the query. Most of them will discard the query and one of them will recognize its IP address and will answer. So when you create large network, broadcast can be a problem. Because the more equipment you have, the more the risk of having broadcast is high. So in IPv6, we will never use broadcast address at layer 2. But instead, we are going to use multicast group, because the multicast group is more scalable than broadcast address. Because only equipment that registers to the multicast group will receive the information. So, what we are going to do in IPv6, is to define an algorithm or a trick that takes an IP address and finds a multicast group for this address. And if we do things correctly, this multicast group will contain only one equipment. And so only one equipment will have to process the information. So the algorithm is this way. So here we have your MAC address. From your MAC address, you are going to create two global two addresses. One is a link local address, and the other one is your global prefix. You may also have also a global prefix with a smaller address ID, for example, to, for yourself. So here you see your host has three addresses. So what you do now is that you are going to create 
a series of multiple groups. So how I do that? I take the last three bits, the right last three bytes of my IPv6 address, and I add them to f 2 column from 1, f And here, we will have this value. So for the two first green IPv6 address, since they derive from the same MAC address, then we will have the same group. And here, for dp column column 1, we have to belong to another one. So, what is the risk to have two hosts that belong to the same address? If we take MAC address, remember, the MAC address is something that is composed of a vendor value and a serial number. So since we take the three that have byte, we are just taking the serial number. So to have a collision, it means that you need to have some HP computer on your network, some Dell computer on your network, so the vendor value will be different, but the serial number will be the same. So this chance is very, very, very low. Now for manually assigned addressing. If, for example, I want to have two hosts with the same address, I have to create a host with, for example, this value. One, let's say, uh, one, zero, 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 one. So this way I take the three last byte, and I will find the same group as this one. But I have to be totally stupid to create this manual ad uh, address. So normally I will put one, two, three, or very small number. So here also, only one host will have this multiplicate group. So what does it mean? Now, when I am doing the equivalent of IRP for IPv6, is that I will have only one equipment that will register to a group. Let's see, FF02, column, column 1, uh, column FF001. So we have only one equipment that will belong to that group. The other equipment of my link will never register to that group. Now, a host in my network wants to go to talk with global prefix column column one. So I do this algorithm and I find this multicast group. I send the information, only one recognize it and answer me. And I will not bother the other equipment by my request. So that's the interest because here it's more scalable. I can have a lot of equipment on my network, but I will just receive some multicast most of the time only for my So that's a very useful algorithm. And then, of course, this multicast address, or IP multicast address, is transformed into a MAC address. And to transform this IPv6 address to a MAC address, then you take the four last bytes of the IP address and you add before 36, 36. And here you have your layer 2 multicast. So, if we look at, we will see again some solicited addresses, but here, if we look at the router, so I went on my Cisco router and I saw, I typed show IP interface, so I have this information. So I know that the IP address of this router, or the linking global address, is this one. The global address is 2001, etc., etc., 1, and here you have the same in the facade. So now if we look at the multicast group, this router I register. So you have one, because it's all nodes, and all the nodes have to register to that group. Then, plum, plum, two, 
because all routers have to register to that group. 12 ground 9, because we are running a read process, and this is the address, the multicast address for read, and this address, which is the solicited multicast address. As you see, here we have only one group, because link local address and global address derive from the MAC address. And here we have FF02, Clumpton 1, FF, and the three last byte of the address. Okay? So, that's all for today.